Okay. Okay. So, um, are you okay? In that case, we can get started. Karen? Yeah, sounds good. Yep, I'm all set here. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Okay, uh, you can That's see great. my... You can see my screen, right? Yes. Yeah, I see okay. the first slide. Uh -huh. Okay. So, um, Dipti Pandit, she is the vice president of MKM. She's going to start the uh, proceedings, and then I'll introduce you, and we'll go from there. So, Dipti, take over, please. Thank you, Sharon. Okay, sounds good. Can you hear me well? Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to this special program where we have a distinguished speaker, Ms. Karen Gray. Uh, Ms. Gray, I'm going to request you, uh, we can see you very well, but the picture is moving a little bit. Yeah. yeah, I went over to, uh, to make sure that I don't run out of uh, charge. Perfect. Thank you so much. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me begin today's special afternoon. In the year 1893, at the World Parliament of Religions in Chicago, Swami Vivekananda commenced his speech with the words, Brothers and Sisters of America, we as part of the Marathi Kala Mandal, MKM, are Americans and Indians who trace their roots in the west coast of India, who believe in this truth of universal brotherhood. We value and take inspiration from the trailblazing contribution of African Americans who built and shaped the fabric of this nation. We, as people of color ourselves, believe in and celebrate the American dream that all men and women are created equal and have an unalienable right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. We are looking forward to learning more about the hugely impactful and inspiring history and culture of African Americans in USA. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to Ms. Karen Gray and would invite Mrs. Sharayu Dukwe to introduce Ms. Gray to the MKM family. Ms. Uh, Mrs. Dukwe, thank you so much for bringing Ms. Karen Gray to our community. Thank you, Dipti. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce um, Ms. Karen Gray, my friend, to Uttaranga and MKM community. Uh, Karen got her uh, Bachelor of Arts degree from Mount Holyoke College in Romance Languages and Literature. And then she got a Master of Arts and Master of Philosophy in French literature from Yale University. Karen taught um, in the Department of French at the Georgetown University. And she was selected as the first class of docents at the National Museum of African American uh, History and Culture. She completed an intensive one-year training to be certified, and it has become a dream come true for Karen to be a docent at the African American Museum, because in addition to her love of languages and literature, she is passionate about American history, and she feels very proud every time she leads people on a tour in the museum to present American history through the African American lens. And so I feel that our community is privileged to have Karen here to give us a, a presentation on American history again through the African American lens. 
Now, before I turn over the microphone to Karen, there are two things I would like to mention. First of all, I would like to thank Rajani Zogrekar, Uttar Ranga, and MKM community and the board for facilitating this talk. And second is, if you have any questions, please send them to me via chat so that at the end of this talk, we can get to your questions. So this is it. Karen, you are on. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Thanks to, uh, to both of you. And I'm delighted to be here. When Ashura, you first suggested that we meet this this afternoon, I said, by all means, and this is by way of an invitation, when the museum reopens, that you will be my guest in person. It would be my pleasure to welcome you to the museum. Meanwhile, we'll have a virtual uh, tour of sorts this afternoon. And I understand that a number of you have already had an opportunity to visit the museum. Yes, I think most everybody is on mute, Karen. So I would say on behalf of the community, yes. <laughs> okay, okay. Because um, I'm going to link some of the galleries, some of the artifacts that uh, either you have already seen or that you'll see when we were able to tour the, the museum in person to link some of the contents, if you will, of the museum to our remarks this afternoon. And the title, The Nightly News, History Hiding in Plain Sight, I realize quite often that a lot of the sort of newsworthy events do have a direct link and there's some correlation to an exhibit in the museum. So with that in mind, I chose five topics that of late have particularly been in the news and I'm going to link those topics to items, artifacts, and galleries within the museum. So the first, so that's what Juneteenth is all about. As you may recall, President Trump back in June had planned a rally on June 19th and the rally was going to take place in Tulsa. So if you're familiar with the date, June 19th, wanted to give you some, some background uh, on why that date is indeed significant. So sort of we'll have a flash backwards to the end of the Civil War, Civil War ended in April of 1865. And, you know, they were getting along quite fine without the internet, without television. So the enslaved in Texas, and of course, distance wise, was yet another reason why word had not traveled that the Civil War had ended in April, they did not receive word in Texas until June 19th, 1865. And be right before the Civil War actually began and during the, uh, during the, the Civil War, folks who owned enslaved workers they kept moving westward to, in a sense, kind of get out of the way of the skirmishes. So we're gonna focus on Texas, Galveston, Texas, to be precise. And June 19th, a gentleman Union soldier by the name of General Granger reached 
Galveston, Texas, and again, this was two months after the Civil War had ended, and he informed the enslaved in Galveston that the Civil War had ended, and guess what? You're free. So that is the origin, that event, that's the origin of the commemoration of the date of June 19th. And also just to put some more uh, context on that date, the Emancipation Proclamation had gone into effect on January 1st, 1863, Word of the Emancipation Proclamation had reached the sort of the western uh, edges of the United States either. So with that announcement that General Granger made on Juneteenth that one, the Civil War had ceased, also enacted the Emancipation Proclamation for that population. So that's why the date uh, still to this year had significance. And officially the date became a holiday in the state of Texas, which was the first given the origins of what I just described to you uh, in January of 1980. Juneteenth has been a holiday in the state of Texas. And as we speak, only Hawaii, North Dakota, and South Dakota have not designated Juneteenth as some sort of a, of a commemorative uh, date on the calendar. However, um, this year, North Dakota did recognize uh, the date as Juneteenth Day in the state of North Dakota. So there's a little uh, background uh, for those of you, if you were wondering, well, gee, why is this date so important? Uh, you know, when you were watching the, the nightly news uh, back in June of this year. For those of you who've already had an opportunity to visit the museum, in the Slavery and Freedom Gallery, you may recall when you reach the very end of that gallery before you proceed up the ramp to go to the next level, there's, in a, it's in a case, there's a, I call it a pocket copy of the Emancipation Proclamation. And what would happen, and we can assume what happened on June 19th of 1865 when General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas, the Union troops, as they moved through the South, would announce the Emancipation Proclamation, which presumably had gone unheard since 1863 with news traveling as slowly as it did at the time. And the, what I refer to as the, the pocket size uh, copy of the Emancipation Proclamation, Union soldiers, they were issued, the Department of War issued these pocket copies. And as the Union soldiers went through the Southern states, they would read from these copies of the Emancipation Proclamation. Because keep in mind, some of the soldiers, they may or may not have been able to read. So for those who were not able to actually read the text, they would memorize ahead of time the important uh, sections out of the Emancipation Proclamation. So again, uh, you may recall having seen that, uh, that little copy of the Emancipation Proclamation in the case that's at the very end of the Slavery and Freedom uh, Gallery. And if not, instead of tour of the museum, uh, I'll be sure to uh, point that out to you. So also, 
in the news back in June, uh, President Trump planned a rally on June 19th of this year, and the rally took place in, of all places, Tulsa, Oklahoma. The mere mention of the city of Tulsa brought to mind what had happened there in 1921 and specifically May 31st, June 1st of the year 1921. And again, you may have wondered, well, gee, why is June 19th so important? And why are people a little intrigued as to why this rally was going to take place on that date? And then of all places, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Well, here's why. On the 31st of May, a shoe shiner, um, a black shoe shiner who worked in, you know, downtown in Tulsa, worked in an office building. And of course, Tulsa, as throughout the South, South segregation was in place. So he couldn't use the restroom on the main floor along with everybody else. There was a special segregated restroom on the top floor of, it was the, called the Drexel office building. So he had to hop on the elevator to go upstairs to use the restroom. So he gets in the elevator and back in the day, and I'm, telling my age here, I can actually remember in the building where my dentist was located when I was like four or five years old. This was back in the day when they actually had elevator operators. So there was a young woman elevator operator when this gentleman entered the elevator and she screams. And of course people are wondering, oh, you know, what's going on there? And Evidently, subsequent to the events that I'm going to tell you about that transpired in Tulsa, come to find out the young shoe shiner, he was not charged of any crime. Evidently, he had stepped on her toe by mistake and she, you know, let out a shriek and chaos ensued in the city of Tulsa. So what happened, people assumed the worst, that this young black man had accosted, somehow assaulted this young white female elevator operator and chaos ensued. So the, the African-American community wanted to get to the shoe shiner and take him away to the Greenwood section of Tulsa, which was where the majority of African Americans lived, to take him to safety because in the meantime, a white mob had formed. They had stormed the courthouse, the jail, trying to get their hands on this young guy and do, you can only imagine, what they intended to do with him. And the Black community responded by trying to save him. Point to keep in mind, I, I mentioned the year that this happened, 1921. So soldiers had returned from what was called the Great War. And a lot of the, the black men who went to save this young man, they were returned veterans who had served this country very proudly during what now is referred to as the, the First World War. And also a point to put into historical context, and not only in Tulsa, in numerous locations around the country, and also in the North, not only in the South, when soldiers returned, when black soldiers returned from the Great War, they were asking themselves, well, wait a minute, I put my life on the line for this country, 
only to return to a life of segregation and second class citizenship. So that was sort of one aspect, uh, sort of a, the underpinnings, if you will, of tension. Uh, for example, during the year 1921, in several locations uh, across the, the United States. Um, and interestingly, I, I found something of interest here. In today's dollars, in the Greenwood section of Tulsa, $200 million of property damage was sustained because of this, this conflict that erupted between the white mob and the black residents who were trying to come to the aid of this uh, young man who had been accused of something that, come to find out, uh, had not transpired. The section referred to as Greenwood also is known by another name, Black Wall Street, because a number of Blacks had moved west because you think of Tulsa, you think of Oklahoma, the oil boom, and set up this very prosperous, thriving community known as Greenwood within the Tulsa city limits. Greenwood was destroyed during this, I was gonna say skirmish, but it was a skirmish times, I don't know how many times over, between May 31st and June 1st, 1921. And I, I have a, uh, a quotation uh, here I'd like to read to you. The Tulsa Tribune removed the front page story of May 31st that sparked the chaos from its bound volumes. And scholars later discovered that police and state militia archives about the riot were missing as well. So if you had been unfamiliar with what I called for today's uh, discussion, tragedy in Tulsa, and Tulsa, that's one of the reasons why, erased from the history books. And another interesting fact that, that I've learned, um, on the morning of June 1st, airplanes were flying over the Greenwood section of the city. And Tulsa has the unfortunate distinction of being the first US city that was bombed from the air. So con consider, consider that. And fast forwarding uh, to 2005, there, there had been a commission on this event that had been established to set the record straight from a historical perspective and also to seek reparations because remember a moment ago, I mentioned that Greenwood sustained $200 million in property damage. And the U.S. Supreme Court in 2005, they decided not to hear the, the case seeking reparations, but there was an attempt by this commission uh, to seek reparations for the damage that folks had sustained. And found out another fact, there were 36, the Red Cross, went in to assist the residents of Greenwood. The Red Cross confirmed 36 members of that community died um, during the outbreak of violence. However, the death toll is estimated at being as high as 300 people who were buried in unmarked graves. And that was another purpose of this commission that studied the uh, the violence uh, back in 
May, on May 31st, June 1st of 1921, to identify these unmarked graves of those who perished during uh, during the violence. And I'm I'm going to leave you leave you with a, a just a a couple of interesting sort of uh, sort of facts here. Uh, and also, before I do that, for those of you who have toured the museum, on the third level of the museum, we have the community galleries. And within the community galleries, there's a, a sub-gallery, if you will, that's called the Power of Place. And there are two wings within the power of place. Five places on one side, five places on the other, Tulsa being one of those places. And the curator of that gallery, Paul uh, Gardulo, uh, I've got just a little tidbit of information here. Uh, he obtained, and which you either have or will see on display, sort of a handful of pennies that were collected, uh, you know, that had been, you know, sort of probably burnt to smithereens uh, that were found underground in a young boy's home during the, uh, the skirmish. And Items with labels saying this was uh, these items that are also on display in the power of place in the museum from a black church. And get this, postcards with photos from what were called the race riots, some showing burning corpses. And you, you might have uh, noticed when I first started telling you about the tragedy in Tulsa, I mentioned the young, uh, the young man who had entered the elevator on his way to the restroom. Well, also, during this time, there had been a resurgence in lynchings. And that was why the Black community the men went to try to take him to safety in the Greenwood neighborhood because they were afraid if the white mom got their hands on him, he would have been, been lynched. And the reason why lynching came to mind after I read that about the postcards from what are called the Tulsa race riots, some showing burning corpses, also on display in the museum, you'll see other postcards depicting lynchings and folks would take their picnic baskets and go, they, you know, word would get out, oh, at such and such a time, you know, this afternoon, hey, there's gonna be a lynching. They'd gather up their picnic baskets with their kids. Because if you look at uh, some of the photos and the postcards, you'll see entire families who'd gone out for an outing to watch a lynching. And lastly, before uh, we leave gr the Greenwood neighborhood in Tulsa, I wanted to, uh, to mention interesting fact. I noted here, Tulsa Race Massacre, and in parentheses, when I typed up my notes for us today, I put in quotation marks, Tulsa Race Riots, and after that, I typed here, what's in a name? This is what I learned. Designating the violence that erupted in 1921, as a race riot, as it's frequently referred to, from an insurance point of view, you could not get insurance benefits compensation for a riot. So interestingly that more often than not, the events that I've just described for you are referred to as the Tulsa Race Riots. But with 
that commission um, back in 2005, they're trying to change the terminology to Tulsa race. What was it? Remember, Red Cross said 36 people died, could have been about 300 people who died. Sounds like a massacre. So Tulsa race riots now termed Tulsa race massacre. And again, in the museum, you'll see the artifacts that I just mentioned, the pennies, those horrific postcards, uh, and the artifacts from a black church in Greenwood in the community galleries in the section that's called the power of place. And also, um, before we, we move on, I always, uh, when I'm in that gallery, there are some videos that run on a loop, and one of which, the year of the massacre was 1921. So a lot of the people who had lived through the massacre, they were still alive and well, uh, you know, when the museum was being sort of put together and that gallery in particular, there's a video and there's one woman who, you know, looked to be probably in her 80s, let's say, and she was, of course, a little girl at the time in elementary school back in 1921. And the date, you might recall, May 31st through June 1st, when the violence erupted, she recalls the following day, she says, oh, we were supposed to get our report cards the next day. So interesting human story. Okay, the next topic that has also been on the nightly news as of late, and I dubbed it the Confederate flag and statue, heritage or hatred. So I wanted to give you some background as to why that's such a hot topic uh, these days. Now, after the Civil War, during, there was a period referred to, probably heard of Reconstruction, when the Union troops went through the South and took conservatorship of the Confederate States. And I mentioned General Granger back when we were talking about Galveston, Texas, who announced the end of the war and the Emancipation Proclamation. Yeah, for about seven or so years after 1865 and the end of the Civil War, the period that we now refer to as Reconstruction, and during that period and for 20, 30 years afterwards, in the South, there was, I'm going to say, a, sort of an overarching uh, way of thinking that, oh, no, the South hadn't lost the, the war. No, it was just a matter, numbers, population-wise, Oh yeah, we were outnumbered, but we really, no, we fought valiantly. We really didn't lose the war. And you may have heard the term that it's, it's a, a Southern term, if you will, for the Civil War. It's referred to as the lost cause only because they had been outnumbered. So to perpetuate that sort of way of looking at history from the 1890s and all the way up through around the 1950s, that's when a number of these statues that have made the nightly news, that's when they were built and erected. And you think, why? Well, it was a way of preserving Southern heritage, history, paying homage to the soldiers who had fought on the side of the Confederacy. And in large part, 
the United Daughters of the Confederacy were behind the fundraising to have these statues constructed and erected. And you might have noticed a lot of times these statues, they're in town squares, you know, naturally. Also, right in front of courthouses. And that's significant because what's, what's the message there? If you're seeing one of these statues right smack dab in front of a courthouse, the message to, and again, we can sort of bring it into what's happening these days to African Americans, a way of, oh yeah, this was the way of life in the South and that better stay in your place. So if, you, if you've noticed the placement of these statues in front of courthouses in particular, that's the message that these statues send at large. So I mentioned that the United Daughters of the Confederacy funded a lot of these, uh, these statues. And, and by the way, of the known and the not so well known of the Confederacy, because some of the statues are sort of just sort of these generic sort of soldiers, um, infantry men. And on the other hand, you know, you have the more prominent uh, characters, you know, Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. Uh, and the, the statues are in large part, again, to send a message about the supremacy of the South and the Confederacy. However, the dates that I mentioned between 1890s, 1950s was when a lot of these, these statues appeared. Well, sort of, they kind of tapered off, the production tapered off um, sometime in the 1950s. And what happened then? From over the horizon, what appears, the Confederate flag. So the Confederate flag, when the production and appearance of these statues tapered off, that's when the Confederate battle flag saw a resurgence. And I mentioned the years that we're thinking 1950s, 1960s, what was going on then? Civil rights movement picked up speed at that time. So rather interesting also at that time was when the Confederate battle flag sort of started flying high at that time as a symbol of the South, the Confederacy, and as a warning, an implicit warning to Blacks, yeah, this is our way of life and you better stay in your place. That's the symbolism of the flag as, as well. And again, a backlash to the civil rights movement. And I, I found in uh, getting ready for, you know, our discussion this afternoon, I, I found out something interesting that I, I hadn't uh, heard before. Uh, just up the road in Baltimore, there, I guess I'll put it in the past tense because they have come down over uh, the past year or so. Two statues, one of Robert E. Lee, the other of Stonewall Jackson in Baltimore. And interestingly enough, those statues were erected in 1948. And when I, I saw the date, 1948, I said, oh, that makes perfect sense. Of course, the, in the presidential election of 1948, 
senator from South Carolina by the name of Strom Thurmond had started his own political party, so not Republican, not Democrat, started a party called the Dixiecrats. And you can take from the name what their platform was. So I thought, hmm, interesting. Those statues went up in Baltimore in, of all years, 1948. So that gives, uh, gives a little bit more context to the points that I've, uh, I've made. And you might wonder, well, why do folks feel so strongly, you know, as you've been watching the nightly news, when you've seen these skirmishes, uh, folks trying to tear down these statues, you might say, well, yeah, they're just, you know, statues, just keep walking right past them, you know, don't let it bother you. But the, the message, these statues, they're not so much monuments to the past as they are to what I'm going to go ahead and call sort of a white supremacist future. And that's why folks take exception to them when they walk past them. And as I said, a lot of times right smack dab in the center of town and right in front, a lot of times, a courthouse. Next up on our topics for this afternoon. Oh, oh and before I do, again, um, when you've already visited the museum or when we will, and I hope the not too distant future, uh, in the slavery and freedom galleries on the second level, which the title of that gallery, it's called Defending Freedom, Defining Freedom, the Era of Segregation, 1876 to 1968. There's a section within that particular gallery, it's called the Jim Crow Era. And it talks a lot about the, what first were called black codes. Uh, you know, you couldn't be out past midnight. Uh, you could only work for so much money. And those black codes evolved into what you probably have heard, the Jim Crow era. And there's actually, um, at the beginning of Defending Freedom, Defining Freedom, that gallery, there's a whole section devoted to the Jim Crow era. And the reason why I wanted to mention that in passing, that's the era during which these statues first came into prominence. Again, a way of keeping history the way it was in the Confederacy and sending a message. Next, we're moving on to law enforcement through a historical lens. And yet again, what we've been seeing, and Shara, you think you just clicked on the slide here, for example, Black Lives Matter Plaza right in Washington, D.C. So here's some historical background looking at law enforcement through this historical lens. So let's backtrack to 1793 and again to 1850. Reason why I've chosen those two dates in American history. That's when two fugitive slave acts went into effect. So again, those two dates, 1793 and 1850. And the Fugitive Slave Act, as the name tells us, meant the following, that if an enslaved person went from South, let's say to Philadelphia. Philadelphia was indeed a Mecca for uh, the enslaved who had escaped. That means those two acts, the Fugitive Slave Acts, meant that anyone up North was compelled to 
capture and return to the rightful owner, the formerly enslaved. In both acts in 1864, Congress repealed both of those fugitive slave acts. But we're going to sort of, so let's start our look at law enforcement at those two points. Uh, uh, 1850 being the more recent of the two. And for those of you who are fans of American history, you probably picked up on the fact the second of those two Fugitive Slave Acts of 1850, part of the Compromise of 1850, that's when the very prominent legislator, Henry Clay, forged the compromise between the Northern and the Southern states. And, you know, sort of as a nod, if you will, to the Southern states, trying to ward off what e erupted in 1861, as you know, is the Civil War, but trying to kind of keep this, what became the Civil War to keep that at bay. Henry Clay forged the Compromise of 1850, and that's where we get the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 to appease, if you will, the Southern states. And if you've seen that movie, 12 Years a Slave, that's what we're talking about here. Solomon Northrup, who was, he was born free. Uh, he was captured in Washington, D.C. in 1841 and was taken down to Louisiana. Made no difference that he was a, a freeborn person. But because of the, you know, the long arm of the Fugitive Slave Act, he was captured, taken down to Louisiana, where he was enslaved. And that's where the title of the, the book, there was a book first, and then the movie, 12 Years a Slave, comes from. And he was able to win back his freedom in 1853, but it was because of those acts. So how were those Fugitive Slave Acts enacted? Well, the legal system provided for what were known as slave patrols to round up formerly enslaved people, return them to slave owning states, and their rightful owners. So to sort of make the link between what we're hearing about today with law enforcement um, and what I call law enforcement through a historical lens. So after the Civil War, a lot of times former, Confederate soldiers, they became police officers and judges. So therefore, the legal system, just by virtue of their sort of political philosophy, was stacked against Blacks if they found themselves before the courts or in police custody. So sort of mull that over uh, for, for a moment. So the slave patrols that I just, uh, just mentioned, when you fast forward to today, the slave patrols were the origins of current day law enforcement, pure and simple. And I mentioned um, at the end of the previous uh, topic when we were talking about, you know, the Confederate statues and the flag of the Confederacy, uh, the reason why those symbols gained prominence, it was a way of reminding people and more forcefully enforcing those Black codes 
and the Jim Crow laws and added over and above, now we've got law enforcement who's also enforcing those laws, Jim Crow laws. And I, I came across an interesting uh, quotation read to you. Court to the Washington Post, 992 Americans died at the hands of police in 2018. That's the last year that there was a complete set of data. Of those, so of those 992 Americans who died at the hands of police in 2018, 229 were black or what amounts to 23%, even though African Americans constitute only 12% of the total population. So do the math. And taking what we're seeing on the nightly news into context, um, I also found, uh, and this, this was, it was a, a coincidence uh, when I was uh, putting together some, some notes for us so for this afternoon. I came across, there's an institute, it's called the Brennan Institute, and I'm assuming it's named for Justice, Supreme Court Justice uh, Brennan. And one of the folks who's, uh, who works in the Institute has done an extensive study on sort of law enforcement and the African American community. And I happened to read online, uh, part of his study focused on the known, the documented connections today between law enforcement officers and either outright racist or militant or you know whatever other label you'd want to put on the white supremacist groups. And I happened uh, to hear on the radio the same gentleman that I had read his uh, you know, his report uh, earlier was speaking on the radio. This was just on, on Friday. So I'll look up, if this interests you, well, look up the Brennan Institute and the study that's done on law enforcement and sort of the, the uh, sort of the, the meeting of law enforcement on the one hand and the African American uh, community. It's, it's very thorough reporting. And I just had one other comment here that to be able to move for society to move forward, that the law enforcement community is going to have to reckon with the past and the racist roots, think back to the slave patrols, or a lot of the, you know, the skirmishes that we've seen within, well, actually just as recently as last week are going to continue. In reference to the National Renault Museum of African American History and Culture, I'm very pleased to say right from the get-go when the museum opened in September of 2016, the museum has entered into a partnership with the Washington DC Police Department. And if some of you happen to have been on a tour at the museum on a Tuesday morning, and I was often there on a Tuesday morning, Tuesday mornings, actually it's Tuesday all day, but uh, the actual tour for the uh, police officers, Tuesday morning, a cohort, usually I'm going to say about 50, every single Tuesday, go to the museum. And there are two professors from the University of the District of Columbia who give a tour of the museum and point out facts such as we're discussing this afternoon so that police officers on the Washington DC force have a sense of the history of the community 
that they're sworn to protect and serve. Very important. And again, I'm very proud of the museum for entering into this, uh, this partnership to try to advance an understanding of history and a dialogue between the, the two groups, law enforcement and the Washington uh, DC community. Uh, also, for those of you who have been through the museum, I already mentioned uh, that second level um, of the history galleries that's called Defending Freedom, Defining Freedom, the Era of, of Segregation, and along with the Jim Crow Era uh, gallery. Uh, if you can envision, there's a wide open space in that gallery for those of you who've been there and you look down to the far end there's a prison guard tower you might have noticed that guard tower is from the angola prison which is located in the state of louisiana and interestingly enough the angola prison in louisiana which has the reputation of being just this very, you know, sort of severe uh, prison, uh, the conditions there, sits on the site of a plantation, the Angola plantation that at once, uh, what one time uh, had been an operation uh, in Louisiana. Uh, but the reason why I'm mentioning that in the context of law enforcement, you may have very well heard the term, the industrial prison complex. There again, private companies charged with running prisons, and think about that in the context of what we've just, uh, just spoken about in terms of the role of law enforcement with the African-American community. So our fifth and final topic, let's take a look at athletes taking a knee. And as recently as just a few days ago, you heard about how players in the NBA, the WNBA, Major League Baseball, Major League Soccer, and also, um, oh, her first name, I think, is Naomi. Um, she's a, a, a tennis player, um, bowed out of a major tennis match in solidarity with the police violence that's taken a hold, and we've seen courtesy of folks video on their cell phones and as recently as what happened uh, this past week in Kenosha, Wisconsin. So very much on the nightly news. So we can think back uh, a number of years. There's oftentimes a sort of a correlation, a nexus between athletes and what's going on socio-politically in this country. So athletes taking a knee or boycotting, you know, they're, and in the case of the, uh, of the NBA, boycotting playoff games uh, of all things, nothing new at all. So the first instance of which you may very well be aware Jesse Owens, 1936 Olympics. And you might recall, where were those Olympics? Berlin, 1936. So main character who springs to mind, Hitler. In the stands, you probably have seen the newsreels uh, of the 1936 Olympics in Berlin with Hitler in the stands. And who's running strong? Jesse Owens from the United States. 
his wins. It's like, hmm. For those folks sitting in the stands who were proponents of Nazism, and then here's this, this black guy from the US and he's winning race after race after race. Hmm. Put into question the whole notion of white supremacy. So I thought about Jesse Owens and then let's fast forward to 11 years to be precise. Now let's switch over to baseball. April of 1947, Jackie Robinson breaks the color barrier in Major League Baseball. Prior to that, you've heard, I'm sure, the Negro Leagues. Yeah, baseball, just as society was segregated, of course, baseball was too, and the players in the Negro Leagues were certainly capable of playing in the major leagues, but well, they couldn't because of segregation. So Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in 1947. So he came to mind. And also for, on a sad note, came to reason, you heard how the actor Chaz Bozeman uh, yeah, passed away yesterday. And one of his films was a biopic called 42, which was the biopic devoted to Jackie Robinson, who proudly wore number 42 for the Yankees. And, you know, a little sort of behind the scenes uh, note on his breaking the color barrier in baseball in 1947. Um, the, um, I'd say, I don't know whether he was the owner or the manager of both, Branch Ritchie, Ricky rather, uh, of the New York Yankees, realized maybe it wasn't such a, you know, sort of a philosophical or a societal decision that he made by Brent Rickey, that is by signing Jackie Robinson to the team, money. It was a money de decision to spread Major League Baseball to the black community as well. And you could sell more, more tickets, more people in the seats that way. So Jackie Robinson also came to mind. Now let's move forward 20 or so years and we have, now at this point, people might have still referred to Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali took a stand against the Vietnam War. He said, hey, those folks never did a thing. Why? Well, to me, why am I going to hop on a plane, join the army, and go fight over in Vietnam? I have nothing against those people. And also, raise the question, why should I go into the army, fight against the Vietnamese, when on these shores did not enjoy the rights and privileges of full citizenship? So. Muhammad Ali, he refused to be drafted. As a result of that, he was arrested. He was stripped of his boxing titles that he had earned up to that point and stripped from boxing. He couldn't box. So he lost out on what would have been the prime years of his boxing career to take the stand. He was not, he was not going to be drafted and he stood his ground. The Supreme Court subsequently 
um, sort of reversed, um, you know, the sort of legal implications that he had suffered. And he, of course, as you know, resumed his boxing career after the fact. So we've got Jesse Owens, 1936, Jackie Robinson, 1947, Muhammad Ali, I believe, ooh, I'm doing this from memory. I think it was either 1969 or 1971, one of those two years. So let's fast forward a few years. Now we're in Mexico City. It is October of 1968. Okay. Okay. There had been another race. Two Americans came out on top. Gold medal, silver medal, bronze medal went to an Australian by the name of Peter Norman. So these three guys, they're on the stand, Olympic Stadium, to get their medals. And Sharayu, show us what they did. If you'd be so kind, the statue of the three Olympians. There they are. And again, for those of you who have walked through, again, in the community galleries, Sports Leveling the Playing Field is the name of the gallery, the entrance to the gallery that we're looking at uh, on this slide. And before you enter the gallery, we have a replica, a statue replicating the moment that I just described, the three Olympians on the podium. And what do Tommy Smith, and John Carlos do. You see there. And this is the statue that is. This is when I give tours, this is my major highlight in sports leveling the playing field. So the significance of this photo, which you have seen time and time again, and of the statue, uh, uh, that's depicted on the slide. Here's the story behind that moment in time. So we've got our gold, silver, bronze medalists on their way to pick up their medals at the ceremony. And what you can't see here on their Olympic jackets, uh, on the right sort of vest, portion of their uh, of their their jackets there's a patch that says international olympians for freedom or something like that that's emblazoned um, on the patch now peter norman who received the bronze medal from australia by the way he, he's on his way to, from the Olympic Village, and he's on the way to the medal ceremony. And he looks down at his jacket, and he says, oh, shoot. Oh, I forgot to put my patch on. So he runs into, of all people, and I, I have to admit, I didn't know the US had a rugby team, but they, they did at the time. And he runs into some American rugby players at the Olympic Village. He says, oh, oh, I'm on my way to a, a ceremony. Oh, may I borrow your patch? So he puts the, the patch on. Now, Peter Norman from Australia, before he hopped on the plane to go to Mexico City to compete in the Olympics, the Australian Olympic Committee, they said a few things to him. They said, okay, first of all, make sure you win the heat for your race. So you'll be able to race in the finals, of course. And they said, secondly, well, okay, you make the race. Please don't lose to a Brit. You know, these are Australians, you know, the kind of rivalry between Australia and Great Britain. And thirdly, stay out of trouble. Lie low. 
Can you remember the date? 1968. The world was in turmoil in 1968. There were street riots in Paris. If you look at sort of news footage from, uh, from that year, just the world was just turned upside down. Okay, not only in this country. So they, the Australian Olympic Committee said, hey, you know, just kind of stay away from any controversy uh, while you're in Mexico City at the Olympics. So he, though, sticks that patch on Olympians for Social Justice. Okay. Now, Tommy Smith, John Carlos, the two Americans who shared the podium with them. If you take a good look at the statue, you notice that there are shoes on the podium, the gold medalist there, he's standing there in his stocking feet. Well, what these two had decided, we see in photos and we see here in this statue to protest for civil rights against segregation, discrimination in the United States. Again, remember this is 1968. And by the way, you remember what had happened previously in 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated on April 4th. Bobby Kennedy had been assassinated on June 5th, if I'm not mistaken, after the California presidential primary. Okay, riots had erupted in this country. Protests against the Vietnam War were ongoing. Okay, so this country as well in turmoil during this year. So the two American medalists here decided we're gonna take off our running shoes and stand on the podium in our stocking feet. That was to represent poverty, the poverty, and especially in the inner cities in this country that African Americans we're trying to overcome, especially at this time, okay? And what we can't see in this view of the statue, but if you, if you queue up, uh, you know, if you're curious, queue up a photo of this event, and you'll notice that Tommy Smith, John, Carlos, they're wearing black scarves around their necks, represent bondage. Last but not least, the gold medalist is raising a fist with a black glove on it. The silver medalist, his left hand raised, black gloved in protest against all of the above that I've just uh, mentioned, okay? They did this on their own. Nobody knew the U.S. Olympic Committee had no clue that these two guys had planned on doing this. The whole world was watching. The U.S. Olympic Committee was not pleased. That's an understatement. These two guys were on the next plane home to the States after having displayed this protest. They were vilified for years to come. No, you know how athletes get their pictures on the Wheaties box? Not these two guys, uh-uh. As I said, they were ostracized. And until you know, I'm going to say relatively recently sort of got their, their good names back as a result of having waged this protest. Another sort of interesting tidbit that I found when I was researching uh, 
you know, these events uh, in preparation for giving tours where I highlight the statue in sports leveling the playing field. Yeah, you might wonder, well, why were they one, why weren't they wearing both of their gloves as i said one's got the right glove on the other one's got the left glove on well this is what happened and i always say very facetiously remember how i mentioned that peter norman had forgotten the patch to put on his uh his olympic jacket well these two guys and i i honestly can't remember whether it was john carlos or tommy smith but one of the two had left his gloves in his dorm room in the Olympic Village, and it was too late to run back to go get them. So they're thinking, oh, you know, they had this protest plan, you know, to raise their fists. It was Peter Norman, the bronze medalist from Australia, when he realized that they didn't have a complete pair of gloves. He kind of shrugged his shoulders, shook his head, and says, guys, what's the problem? One of you wear the right glove, the other one wear the left glove. That's why I found that out. And as a sort of as a sort of an afterthought um, to what happened on the Olympic podium that particular day, when Peter Norman got back to Australia, remember I mentioned that third piece of advice, it was a little bit stronger than advice, that the Australian Olympic Committee had given him, a, you know, stay out of trouble, there's too much turmoil going on, 1968, blah, blah, blah. And there he is, sort of guilt by association on the podium with these two guys, and then proudly wearing that patch on his jacket. He was ostracized in the athletic community in Australia for that very reason. And on a sort of a sad note, he, I think it was about, I don't know, five or six years later, so obviously at a very young age, he passed away unexpectedly of a heart attack. And guess who hopped on a plane to be pallbearers in Australia at his funeral, Tommy Smith, John Carlos. So another instance now, so we've got the raised fist, Colin Kaepernick taking a knee. This was four years ago, time flies, okay? taking a knee, as it's been come to known, during the, and, and here, thanks Shashari, the cover of Time Magazine, The Perilous Fight, taken straight out of what tune? National Anthem, Star Spangled Banner. And the act of taking a knee during the playing, the singing of the National anthem. First of all, this is my humble personal opinion. Taking a knee, personally, I don't see as being, you know, this radical pose. You know, it's almost, you know, in reverence to the cause of his taking a knee, Colin Kaepernick, that is, in protest to societal political injustices. That's how I see it. But interestingly, how Time Magazine, their little headline there, the perilous fight. Listen to this. And I, I found out something interesting about the composer of our national anthem, Francis Scott Key. During the War of 1812, which was when you know the national anthem was uh, was written, Francis Scott Key um, he was you know in the army, the American uh, army, and 
the Americans were once again fighting the British during the War of 1812. And you probably have heard how the White House was burned down during uh, that particular war. Well, during the Battle of Bladensburg, Maryland, close by, Francis Scott Key, fighting proudly for the Americans and a regiment in the army, he encountered a group fighting for the British known as the Colonial Marines. The Colonial Marines fought for the British. They were not British subjects. They were runaway enslaved people who, with the promise of their freedom from the British, said they were going to fight with the Brits and not with the Americans. So we've got this Battle of Bladensburg. So Francis Scott Key on one side, the colonial Marines, i.e. these runaway enslaved on the other side, and the colonial Marines, let's just say they did themselves proud that day. They defeated the Americans. So Francis Scott Key, who was a lieutenant in the American army, also a slave owner, so lieutenant slash slave owner, of course, he didn't take too, too calmly to this defeat at the hands of the colonial Marines, these runaway enslaved men. So he's, Francis Scott Key, he sits down, you know, at Annapolis and pens the Star Spangled Banner. The third stanza goes this way. I'm gonna read the third stanza of the Star Bang Spangled Banner to us. I'm not gonna sing it, I'll spare you my singing. I'm just gonna read it. And where is that band who so vauntingly swore that the havoc of war and the battle's confusion. Indulge me, that little tune. A home and a country should leave us no more. Their blood has washed out their foul footsteps pollution. No refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of and the Star Spangled Banner and Triumph Doth Wave or the Land of the Free and the Home of the Brave. Knowing that's the third stanza of the Star Spangled Banner in my, uh, my notes here, I wrote, I said, oh, yet another reason athletes might kneel. Interesting, something to uh, to mull over there. And bringing this, taking a look at athletes taking a knee up to literally as we speak right now. Yeah, the NBA players boycotting their playoff games for three or four days this past week. So, you know, some people might say, well, gee, what's, what's that got to have to, what's that have to do with playing basketball? It's a playoff, you know, for heaven's sake. Well, in so doing, by not playing, they're making a statement and drawing attention to, in this instance, to violence at the hand of police and most recently, Kenosha, what happened in Kenosha, Wisconsin. So there's a way to put this whole issue of taking a knee into its proper context. And again, uh, you know, you can uh, see that statue if you haven't already had the chance to do so in, of all places, sports leveling the playing field in the museum. 
so with that, our fifth and final topic, I am delighted to take questions, to hear your comments, anything you'd like to, uh, to offer. Okay, I do have some questions for you, Karen. Wonderful. Um, yes, the first question was, the Revolutionary War of 1776. Mm -hmm. Was retaining slavery one of the reasons for that war? For the revolution of the American Revolutionary War, no. No, that was slavery, that is, was not an issue at all. That was to gain independence from Great Britain front and center. However, I'm, I'm glad, uh, thank you whoever uh, asked that question because you reminded me of something. Uh, I mentioned um, in the last segment there uh, about taking a look at athletes taking a knee and how the colonial Marines during the War of 1812, they, they being runaway enslaved men had joined up with the British because the British promised them, after the fact, their freedom. They could move to Canada or hop on a boat and sail across the pond to Great Britain. Also during the, that wasn't the first time, which is why I'm glad uh, to have that question. During the American Revolution, Lord Dunsmore, who was the colonial governor of this, what became the state of Virginia, his name was Lord Dunsmore, a British gentleman, he promised enslaved men, if they fought with the Redcoats, with the British, during the American Revolution, same thing. You fight with us, after the fact, you win. Move on up to Canada. Come on over to England. And this was something that I learned um, in preparation for becoming a docent. More enslaved people, men, fought for the British than fought for the what became the Americans for the colonials. Interesting, because that was a way to, they hope, to gain their freedom. And by the way, putting the galleries of our museum into context, also in the community galleries, the military gallery, the proper name of the gallery is Double Victory, origins of that name during, okay, you're going to get historical whiplash now. Fast forward to World War II. Uh, there was a, a African-American widely circulated nationwide newspaper. It was called the Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania Courier. And a young man from, I believe he was either from Kansas or Kentucky, one of the two, uh, a black young man, 18 year old, wrote a letter to the editor and he said, well, you know, why should I sign up with the army and go over to Germany? And it was the same argument that Muhammad Ali had made. Why should he have gone to fight the Vietnamese? This young man, World War II, said, yeah, why am I going to go fight the Germans? They haven't done anything to me. I'm not even a citizen and a full, fully privileged citizen in this country. So the editors of the Pittsburgh Courier, as a result of having received that letter to the editor, got the idea, wait a minute, we can kind of start a campaign out of that. It was dubbed the double victory campaign, victory abroad as a result of enlisting with the army, navy, marines, victory at home, double victory. 
And I always point out to visitors uh, at the museum that double victory goes all the way back to the American Revolution, those enslaved soldiers who signed up with the British because they thought they could achieve a double victory. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question is, uh, you know, we talked about the Juneteenth and how the, the enslaved people in Texas found out about emancipation. But um, what happened to the emancipated slaves? Were they given financial compensation, jobs, or some way of earning their livelihood? And how did they, in the southern states, how did they find out that they were emancipated? Mm -hmm. oh, good question. Well, as the Union soldiers went southward, again, after the, the end of the Civil War, and just as what happened on Juneteenth in Galveston, Texas, that was how word spread of both the Emancipation Proclamation, which by the way, a footnote to the Emancipation Proclamation, some of you may already be aware of this, the Emancipation Proclamation of January 1st, 1863, applied only to enslaved in the Confederacy did not apply to folks who were enslaved in the sort of northern areas of the United States. So that's an interesting footnote. Uh, but it was because of post-Civil War and during Reconstruction, those years that immediately followed the Civil War, that those living in that the formerly now enslaved in the South found out that they were no longer enslaved. You may have heard this phrase, 40 acres and a mule. That's what was promised to formerly enslaved people during Reconstruction, 40 acres of land to till and a mule. And during Reconstruction, that's where the, the name of that period, of course, comes from. And we have, actually, this didn't come up earlier, we have those three amendments. The 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, okay, got rid of slavery. 14th Amendment guaranteed full citizenship, that was the 14th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment, franchisement, the right to vote. But of course, that only applied to men. <laughs> Didn't apply to women. We've been here. Actually, speaking of the nightly news, yeah, just this past week, the 100th anniversary for women's right to vote. So women did not fall under the 15th Amendment. Um, but those, those three amendments, that meant that Black men could vote and run for office. So in the museum, and if you look up what I'm about to share with you, there's a famous photo of probably about eight or 10 members of the U.S. House of Representatives who were formerly enslaved men. So during Reconstruction, there was an opportunity to own the land that you cultivated, to own businesses. A number of predominantly Black communities sprung up during Reconstruction. Uh, you could be elected to office. Number of schools, universities were founded during this period. So 
I, I believe that was that was part of uh, the questioner's question. Uh, you know, what happened after the Civil War? Immediately afterwards, there was an opportunity to advance economically, politically, socially, educationally, and then uh, Reconstruction. Kind of the curtain came down on Reconstruction, and that's when those black codes and what became the Jim Crow laws came into being and sort of the resurgence, what we talked about, of the sort of Confederate way of thinking emerged. So did, did I answer your question? Yes, yes. Um, now I have a question for Aniruddha or Dipti. I think we are running over time, so um, I, I guess uh, we can stop here. And if people have more questions, exactly. uh, they, can, exactly. they can email me um, or on WhatsApp, they can send me the questions and then I will um, connect with Karen and uh, we can then try to get you the answers and then of course when the museum opens you can take the tour with her and yes. ask her all those questions in person oh yeah i only wish i could give you a date and a time to do so but you'll be the first to know as soon as i know yeah yes. you're very welcome to to come and see all of this in person it would be my pleasure well, this was wonderful, Karen. It's always a learning experience when I interact with you. And I hope that everybody enjoyed and this was a wonderful history lesson. Well, no, and thank you for asking me. No, I've been excited about this ever since you mentioned the possibility of doing this. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, good to see you. Yes. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, hope to see you at the museum. Sure, definitely, definitely. Yes. Bye, Karen. Okay, I'll talk with you soon. Thank yes. you again. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.